Okay, welcome everybody uh, to another edition of Lagoon. And um, before we start, let me just make an announcement that um, we have a future seminar on uh, the uh, on the 27th of October, which is by Geofa Chen from Paris. So you see the announcement on our uh, Lagoon webpage as usual. And now it's a very great pleasure to welcome Hilaria Lideda from King's College London, and she's going to talk about the symplectic interpretation of Ausländer correspondence. So, Hilaria, up to you. Cool. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And I also want to take the chance to thank the organizers for um, giving me the chance to speak at the seminar. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to say, I've said this before, if you have any questions, feel please feel free to interrupt at any point. Um, I don't think I'm able to see the chat. So if you write it there, someone else will uh, read it out. But yeah, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, so let's start with uh, with my talk. So uh, my talk is called the Sympathetic Interpretation of Auslander Correspondence. And the idea of this talk is that I want to relate my two areas of interest, which are sympathetic geometry and representation theory. Um, and specifically, I want to take something that is known is in, in, sorry, in representation theory, um, some well-known concepts and give them a syntactic interpretation. Um, so let me start with um, what the talk is going to look like. So I'm starting on the representation theory side. So I will introduce the concepts that we care about. Um, and specifically, I will talk about this Auslander correspondence that some of you may know, some of you may not know, uh, but I'm going to, to talk about it in detail. So you should, don't worry if you haven't heard of this before. Um, and this is all well-known things that I'm going to talk about. Um, next, uh, I'm going to switch to the geometry side. Um, and to do that, I'm going to talk about some Fukaya type categories. Um, and at this point here, I'm going to introduce the main results that we have um, as, as to as with, um, in, the, in this context. Um, I will at this point also give you uh, a motivation as to why we care about giving a sympathetic interpretation to these well-known objects. Um, and after this, I will give you a strategy as um, how one goes to, to prove this um, results that we have. I will not go into detail about the proof, but I want to sort of give you the main tools that go behind this proof. Um, okay, so let's start on the presentation tool. Um, just as a disclaimer, throughout the talk, I'm going to be talking about a field K. I will pretty much always think of it being the field of complex num numbers, but you can, you can think of it as your favorite field. Just pick one and, and stick with it until you need to talk. Um, all of the algebras that I've been going, I'm going to mention are going to be finite dimensional. Um, so these are quite nice algebras to study. And in particular, what I want to do and what representation theory usually does, it studies the representation of certain algebras. So we will be working with A being a Norton algebra. So this is a finitely generated algebra as a K module. Um, and we specifically care about when this algebra here is of finite representation type, which I will sometimes denote as FRT. Um, this, by definition, means that this algebra we care about has finitely many representations up to isomorphism. And by definition, this is equivalent to saying that A has finitely many um, irreducible A modules, again, up to isomorphism. Um, so we care about studying the representation of these algebras that have finitely many irreducible modules of them. Okay. Um, so there are many, many tools in representation theory to study this algebra. Uh, the set of tools we utilize here falls under the umbrella of Auslander writing theory. Um, and specifically, there are results in Auslander writing theory that we are interested in studying. The main um, object, the main result that we are interested in studying here is this Auslander correspondence. Auslander correspondence um, is used to, to study the representation theory of certain algebras of finite representation type. And at its core, it is a rejection. It is a one to one correspondence between the algebras we care about studying. So these are the finite representation algebras we, are, we have, um, and um, a sort of another class of algebras that um, in some sense are 
more um, intrinsic, they are homological algebra. They are something that is easier to study under certain uh, terms. So these are algebra that uh, satisfy these conditions, um, these conditions on their dimension. So specifically, these algebras we care about on this other side are algebras whose global dimension is at most two uh, and whose dominant dimension is at least two. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, these two dimensions have um, they are very natural dimensions that one can associate to algebras. This has to do, well, both of them have to do with modules over this algebra. Uh, this has to do with um, projective resolutions of modules of an algebra, and specifically uh, with the length of projective resolutions. This here has to do with injective power solutions, and again, specifically with the maximum uh, length that an uh, injective power solution can have. Um, so again, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these algebras here and these algebras here, where both classes are taken up to more equivalence. So this is again a very natural equivalence of algebras one can consider. Um, I do want to mention that this this correspondence here allows us to study the representation theory of one um, via the sort of homological. Nicer corresponding algebra. So this we are going to study these algebras here as a way to study these algebras here on the other side. And I do also want to mention that this correspondence here is quite explicit in the sense that if one takes uh, an algebra of any representation type, then you denote it by A, you can explicitly define this corresponding Auslander algebra. This is called the Auslander algebra. which is defined as the endomorphism algebra of M, where M is an additive generator. So this is an additive generator of the category of modules over A. Okay, um, so we're going to study the endomorphism algebra of an additive generator of the, the algebra we have on the left-hand side. Um, and at this point, I should make a disclaimer in the sense that um, there is no, as far as I know, complete classification of all of the algebras of any representation type. Uh, it's a very big class of algebras one can study. Uh, so I'm not going to study all of the algebras of this type in the most general context. Um, what I care about and what we have here is we're going to consider a specific family of finite representation type algebras, and we're going to construct the corresponding family of Alexander algebras. Um, and to describe which family this is, I'm going to give some preliminary definitions. Um, so by a quiver, I mean a finite collection of vertices and arrows between the vertices. And by a path algebra, I mean a very natural algebra that one can associate to a quiver. And uh, this algebra is defined as follows. As a, vector, as a vector space, um, it is spanned by all of the paths that um, uh, appear in the quiver of possible length zero. And um, multiplication in this algebra is given by concatenation of paths. Uh, so let me give you an example before I move on to something else. Let me take this quiver here, the A3 quiver. Um, the A3 quiver is a quiver, comes from a name, uh, it has three vertices, which are labeled as one, two, and three. And it has two arrows which are labeled as A and B. Uh, I want to construct the path algebra K A3, which again, as a vector space, it's spanned by paths in this figure. So you can see that there are three paths of length zero, um, starting and ending respectively with the vertices one, two, and three. So we're going to have three generators of this algebra um, corresponding to these three paths, which I'm going to denote as E1, E2, and E3. So these are three generators. Uh, then there are two parts of length one, which are labeled as A and B. So these are two arrows. So there are going to be two more generators of the algebra. And finally, there is exactly one path of M2, which is just the path AB. And this gives us the final generator of the algebra. I'm just going to write it as BA because I'm concatenating from the left. Um, Right, so this is the algebra as a vector space. 
And again, multiplication is given by concatenation. What does that mean? Uh, it means, for example, that if I want to multiply B times A, this is just given by the generator BA. And if two parts can be concatenated, then the corresponding um, multiplication is zero. So for example, A and B in this order can be concatenated, so this is just zero. Okay, um, any questions so far? If not, um, let me uh, move on to the example that we actually care about. Um, so I've mentioned that there is no um, complete classification of all of the algebras of any representation type, but as far as quivers are concerned, there is, and this is known as the classification theorem, which is due to Gabriel uh, in 1972. So this is a very classical result uh, with this in representation theory. Um, this theorem sort of classifies all of the quiver, quivers whose path algebra is of any representation type. And it's a very nice classification, and it states that a quiver is a final representation type if and only if its underlying graph, graph is of thinking type ADE. So we want to start by studying these algebras, which we know to be of final representation type, and we want to study their correspondent ensemble algebra. So for us, the family of algebras we care about are, um, as you might have guessed from the name, um, algebras coming from this quiver here, which is known to be the A and quiver. So this is a quiver with N vertices and arrows going through from the vertex I to the vertex I plus one. Um, we know, thanks to Gabriel, that this is um, a final representation type. We know more than that. We know that it has exactly N plus one choose to um, isomorphism classes of irreducible alien modules. So we can quite explicitly compute um, a complete collection of the irreducible modules up to isomorphism, and we can compute the Alexander algebra again quite explicitly as the endomorphism algebra of this collection of irreducible modules. So I've denoted here by um, I to be a complete um, collection of generators. So these are irreducible modules. Okay, um, it's still it it may still seem to be quite an abstract uh, thing to study, um, but the the beauty of Auslander writing theory is that all of these algebras, all of these Auslander algebras, are quite explicit and they are quite they have quite a nice presentation in the sense that all of the Auslander algebras, specifically the Auslander algebras of type A here. So I'm just going to denote this one as well. This is denoted called as the Auslander algebra of type A as the Auslander algebra corresponding to the AN quiver. Um, so the um, Auslander writing theory allows us to, to view Auslander algebras as quivers themselves. So in the sense that um, Auslander algebras arise as path algebras associated to certain quivers with relations. Um, by this, I mean a slight generalization of quivers in the sense that path algebras associated to quivers with relations, they are quotient algebras. So they are path algebras quotiented by an ideal. And this ideal we require to be ideal generated by a uh, finitely many relations uh, between the paths of the, um, of the, between the hours of the pair. Okay. Um, I want to explain what I mean by the fact that Alexander algebra arises this path algebra of the relations. So let me take an example. Let me take the quiver A2 which is known to be the quiver with two vertices, one and two, and one arrow between them. So let me denote this as A. One can check, um, one can also possibly use uh, Gabriel's theorem uh, that the, the path algebra here, Ka2, which is, let me write it again. This is spanned by E1, 
the two as the two parts of length zero and the one part of length one. Um, one can again check that this algebra here has three um, irreducible K2 or K2 modules up to isomorphism. And let me call this uh, M1, M2, and M3. And the, the thing is that one can quite explicitly write this down um, as just modules over this algebra. Um, one can also check that, um, for example, if I'm labeling them correctly, there is exactly one morphism from the module which I've labeled as M1 to the module which I've labeled as M2. And there is also exactly one uh, morphism from M2 to M3. So here I'm denoting as um, the vertices of a quiver, the isomorphism classes of modules, and as arrows, the uh, morphisms between modules. Um, I also, one can also check that there is no morphism from M1 to M3, so I'm going to denote this by a relation. So let me label this um, quiver as these two arrows, X and Y, uh, and the relation that Y, X is equal to zero. So one can check, I'm not saying that this is obvious, one can check that uh, the Auslander algebra gamma two, which is by definition the Auslander algebra associated to the path algebra Ka2, um, is given by the quotient algebra of this quiver here. So this is Q2, which has two vertices, three vertices, sorry, two arrows. And the ideal generated by the relation that y x is equal to zero. Okay, so it's it's quite natural how one can construct a quiver associated to a one of one algebra. Um, in fact, one can check that for generic n, um, the Auslander algebra associated to the quiver of type A n arises as a quotient algebra of this path algebra Q, uh, KQN, modded out by the ideal generated by all of the squares commuting. What I mean, what do I mean by that? Um, so the quiver QN here is given as this sort of triangular quiver in the sense that for generic N, it has N rows and N columns. It has vertices along sort of the lattice points, point, point, points of, the, of this triangle. And when I say that squares commute, I mean, for example, let me take this square here. Um, I mean that the composition of the two arrows B, A is equal to the composition of the two arrows uh, C and D in this order, okay? Uh, there is some further relation. So I've denoted uh, below the diagonal of this triangle, I've denoted these vertices as zero to mean that the compositions of these arrows being equal to the composition of these arrows um, has to compose to zero. So if I'm doing this as x, y, then y, x is equal to uh, zero, which is just the composition of these two zero arrows. Um, but this is how one can uh, explicitly write down the quiver associated to uh, an Auslander algebra of type A. Um, Right, so now that we have constructed this Alexander algebras, um, let me say one last thing um, about the representation capital side of the things we want to study. Um, so we have algebras. Um, we don't really want to study them directly because there's some, um, we have made some choices, for example, on the choices of isomorphism classes of um, modules we want to study. So instead of studying algebras, we want to study categories. Um, so the idea is that we want to go from these algebras, uh, gamma n's we have defined, to some categories. Uh, and the most natural category one can consider is the perfect device category, which is a, a category um, whose objects are bounded complexes of projective gamma n modules, and whose morphisms are morphisms of complexes. So again, this is a very natural category we can associate to this algebra, and it's what we're going to, to study. Um, this is, again, as I've said, all that I want to say about representation theory. Is there any question on anything I've said so far?
If not, let me move on to geometry. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the idea is that we want to uh, go from this well-known object to something more geometric. Um, and I'm going to spoil, spoil the result for you. Um, what we want to do is what we want to prove an equivalence of category. Um, and specifically, we want to prove that this category here, um, as, an, as a triangle category, it is equivalent, it is quasi-equivalent to a Fukaya category. And specifically, we want this to be quasi-equivalent to the Fukaya side of category of a family of Laschet's um, vibrations here. So I want to unpack what this means. So this is, maybe let's write it out. So this is the Fukaya side of category of a Laschet's vibration. So in the next, say, 10 minutes, I'm going to uh, say explicitly what these lecture foundations are and how to construct the, this um, fairly complicated um, Fukaya side categories out of them. Um, so let me start from, from the beginning. So what is a lecture foundation? By a lecture foundation, I mean a map from C2 to C, um, which satisfies some nice properties in the sense that it has uh, finitely many um, isolated and non-degenerate singularities, which I'm labeling as P1 to PK, um, such that near each singularity, uh, the, the map, the Lefschetz vibration looks, it has a standard presentation of X squared plus Y squared, and such that away from this singularity, F is a locally trivial fiber bundle, in the sense that away from the singularities, uh, the fibers look the same, and because of dimension reasons, they are Riemann surfaces. If this definition seems familiar to you, is because in some sense, um, leftist vibrations are the complex analog of Morse functions, in the sense that they have um, a, a local presentation um, near singularities. Uh, they have nice singularities. They have isolated non degenerate singularities. And away from the singularities, they are regular functions. The two key differences between Morse functions and um, left shift vibrations is that um, away from the singularities, all of the fibers for left shift vibrations look the same. That's quite different from Morse functions where you have level sets and depending on which level sets you are on, um, the fibers look different. The other key difference is that because we are working with complex uh, variables, there is no notion of index. So if you know from Morse theory, well, indexes of a singularity, uh, you will know that this depends on the plus and minuses of the, of the local presentation of the function. There is no such notion of index here because you can just reparentize it so that all of the um, coefficients are plus ones. Uh, so that's the two key differences. But apart from that, they are fairly similar to most functions. Um, I want to give you an example of what these uh, left shift foundations look like. So uh, let me take this example here. Let me take F as defined from C2 to C to be this U cube minus three UV. Um, and let me write down here C as the, um, as the base of this vibration here. So one can check that this vibration has um, exactly one singularity at the origin. And again, one can check that above this singularity, the fiber looks like the following. So it's, um, it's a cylinder with the nodal singularity. Um, where the singularity here is nodal, it's, it's a number general singularity, and it looks like this sort of pinched uh, cylinder. One can also check that um, above any other regular value here, let me denote this as star, the fiber looks like the following, so it's a cylinder and nothing else. Um, and let me take, for example, a regular value. Let me fix a regular value to be infinity. So again, the fiber above this here looks like a cylinder, which is the same as the fiber above each other regular value. Um, let me do something more here. Let me take, let me, let me fix this regular value here to the infinity, this one. Um, and let me take and fix once and for all a path connecting this regular value here with this critical value here. So let me take something that goes like that. Again, above each point of this path, you have a fiber that looks like a cylinder. And specifically, let me take a fiber which is close to the singularity. So let me take something here 
looks like a cylinder. Again, the point is that because of the local charts, the local presentation of the vibration, um, which near singularity looks like this x square plus y square, um, what we observe is that on this fiber here, there is a circle, a sphere, which as you approach the, the critical value, shrinks down to a point. So there is a distinguished uh, circle here that shrinks down to a point uh, that gives you the nodal um, singularity. Um, and the point is that um, these left shift vibrations are quite powerful in the sense that you can, having fixed a path, you can transport this um, circle to any other fiber. And you can do so syntactically. So you can use syntactic parallel transport to transport uh, this circle to any other fiber. So you can have something here and something here as the syntactic parallel transported uh, circle to any other fiber. We call um, this circle here to a, uh, on, a, on a regular fiber uh, to be the vanishing cycle. Um, and this depends on, first of all, it depends on what the singularity is, and it depend, depends on the choice of path uh, you have taken down the base, connecting the, the critical value and the regular value you have fixed. Um, so you define this to be the vanishing cycle. And if you take above a fixed path, all of the vanishing cycles in each fiber, you take the union of all of these cycles, um, you call that union left shift thimbles, thimble. Um, so a thimble is the union of the vanishing cycles and topologically it is a disk. So it's the union of a bunch of circles plus the nodal point you have here. So it's topologically a disk. Um, if you have more than one singularity, you repeat the process in the sense that um, you will have, let me draw it up here. You have a base here, you have a, a collection of um, critical values, you fix a regular value, say at infinity, and you choose a collection of paths connecting each critical value to the regular value. Um, the only conditions you put is that these paths, they are non-self-intersecting, and they are uh, disjoint, pairwise dis disjoint uh, away from the regular value you have fixed. If you repeat this process, you've constructed a collection of vanishing cycles and symbols associated to the choices you've made um, of, of paths and so on. Okay, um, let, me, let me say some basic properties about these vanishing cycles and symbols. So by construction, all of the thimbles intersect in the regular fiber you have fixed because you have, let me draw the picture here again. You have a collection of critical value and you have regular value up here and you have a collection of paths going something like that. And all of the thimbles intersect in the fiber of this point here. Um, these topological disks are what we care about in symplectic geometry and specifically in uh, uh, Fukai categories. Um, modulo some extra data we can attach to, this, uh, to these objects. Um, in particular, we want to uh, give these objects a grading structure and a spin structure, which in our case we can do. Um, we, yes, we, we can attach some extra data to these objects and we can make them into Lagrangian brains. These Lagrangian brains are, in some sense, the objects of study um, in Fukaya categories, in Fukaya um, categories, in Fukaya cyber categories. Um, there is some extra um, data, some extra properties we have for these objects, uh, in the sense that, based on the choices we've made, um, these objects come in a natural order, in the sense that you can see it here probably. Um, there is a natural clockwise order of the vanishing paths. At the, at the regular value we have here. And this clockwise order gives uh, an order of the symbols here. Um, so for an ordered pair, so if you have bi less than bj in this clockwise order, you can define a morphism space between two objects as spanned by the uh, intersection points between uh, two symbols. Um, there is some extra um, choices you can make. So for example, you can generically make intersections to be um, transverse. So you can count things, you have finitely many, um, and this is well-defined and well-studied. Um, if you have seen this before, this is also 
the floor complex between the I and the J. And when I say floor complex, I do actually mean floor complex because the grading we have attached to these objects uh, gives us a grading of the intersection points, which turns this um, home space into a complex. So with respect to these choices in this construction, we can construct the endomorphism algebra of this collection of thimbles here, of these Lagrangian brains here. Um, this algebra here has a very good structure in the sense that it's actually an A infinity algebra. Okay, so when I say A infinity algebra, I mean it is an algebra that has infinitely many products and not just a uh, possible differential or, or, or a composition, it has quite as many um, um, products. Um, these products that you can construct of this um, endomorphism algebra is quite, um, in some sense, combinatorial because they are basically um, the product, say, uh, D. It is a map from fluid complexes let me just write them out without explaining that they are. This is a map from the tensor product of these complexes here. D0, D1, to CF star D0, DD. Um, and each of these maps for any D counts things on the surface. So it counts things like that look like that, where each intersection point is an input of this operation and one of them is the output of the operation. So each of these product counts polygons embedded in the surface. Um, right, so, so these products are quite specific, but the point is that we have this infinity algebra uh, we can quite naturally define. Um, so we define the Fukaya saddle category associated to um, a left shift vibration to be the A infinity category, which is generated by this collection of uh, objects here. Um, if you have seen Fukaya saddle categories, and if you have seen slightly different definitions of it, um, then you have that the, the fact that this is actually generated by this collection here is due to cycle. And more importantly, um, the Fukaya side of category is not dependent of any of the choices we've made, in the sense that if we had chosen different paths, if we had chosen different gradings and all of that, um, this is independent of all of the choices. Um, so in particular, any two collections we construct in this way can be related to each other through a series of mutations in the category. Um, Another important property we have of this category it has, it, it's that we have a very natural restriction factor um, as defined from the Fukaya side of category to the usual compact Fukaya category of the of a regular fiber of this vibration, in the sense that uh, each object, each generator, the I, is sent to its boundary, the I which is, as we have seen, a vanishing cycle, which is in the Fukaya category. Um, what do you want to say? Um, this object here, we can see it as an object of the compact Fukaya category of the fiber, so the, there is this natural restriction factor. Um, and this restriction factor here, on one hand, uh, we care about it because it's, it's what I'm going to use later to sort of justify uh, why I care about what I'm doing. Uh, but more importantly, it allows us to carry out all of the, um, the computations that we have in this in C2. Um, two computations we can carry out in the main fiber, which for our intents and purposes, it is a surface, so we can write everything down. We have curves and we have intersection points, and we can actually see everything on a surface. So that's why we care about uh, specifically this, this factor here and this precarious other categories here. Um, any questions so far? I'm going to now. I'm going to move on to our case at hand and define a family of um, sort of left shift vibrations in our context. But um, is there any question on the sort of more um, background knowledge of of these things here?
If not, let me um, continue. So um, I'm going to spoil you what the, what the result is. I'm going to give you a family of left vibrations and um, the family that I give you is going to turn out to be the right choice we can make in this context here. Um, let me take the following maps. Let me define Fn to be a map not defined on C2, but defined on, on the symmetric product of C2. Um, this is um, a space um, whose objects are unordered pairs of coordinates on C, on C. So it takes the unordered pair x to y, and it sends it to x n plus y n. This is a well-defined uh, map on the symmetric product. And in fact, even though it's not given, on C2, uh, it is a standard and well-known fact that this space here is actually isomorphic to C2, okay? So what I've given you is I've given you a map on C2 to C, just in different coordinates, okay? Um, so if we have, uh, if you haven't seen this before, maybe it's interesting to see, but um, there is a quite natural isomorphism from C2, from, from the symmetric product of T2 to C2 send in the coordinate x, y to x plus y, x, y, which gives the change of coordinates the one needs to give up this, this map here as a, as a function as you do rather than seem to. Um, so the point is that this family here is not yet a left shift vibration or each, each map is not a left shift vibration because it has an isolated singularity at the origin, which is the generate. Um, so what one can do is you can, Per term, you can add, for example, some linear terms to make this map um, non-degenerate. So it will have a certain number of similarities, which will depend on n, um, which can be at the origin or will be away from the origin, but each of them will be isolated. Um, and the point is that the category, the Fukaya said the category we can construct does not depend on the perturbation we, we, we choose. So we can uniquely define the Fukai of the category of a singularity at the origin, uh, in this case specifically. So one can check that uh, this should work in the sense that the, um, the number of singularities of this map here we have defined is n minus one choose two, which will match up with, um, with what we want to construct. So the, um, the result we have, um, the result we have is that the perfect derived category of Auslander algebras of type A, which is what we had, is uh, equivalent to the higher side of category of F n plus two. It's, there's a slight shift in number of the matter. You can, you can choose this n to be different so it very much is up. Uh, but this is the main result we have. We have an equivalence of categories, one of which is um, more algebraic, more representation theoretical, the other one is more geometric. It's a Fukaya side of category. So as a corollary, um, I've mentioned before that there is exi there exists a restriction factor from um, the Fukaya side of category F and plus two to the Fukaya category of the um, compact to the compact Fukaya category of the fiber, which I'm going to make next here. This is the Fukaya category of a regular fiber of this map here. But we also know that this is equivalent to the perfect derived category of our random algebra of type A. Okay, so I'm, I'm emphasizing this because this restriction here is what will provide. Um, um, a syntactic interpretation to the other the performance that I'm interested in. Um, and I do want to point out at this point that um, I'm talking about a syntactic interpretation of Alexander algebras in the sense that there, there is previous work um, relating this category here to another Fukaya type category. Uh, in particular, there is uh, work by, uh, there is work by Dickel, and the kitty, proving that the perfect derived category of 
as on the algebra of type A is equivalent to an other type category. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail about what this is. Um, this is going to be a partially replica category of some syntactic manifold with a collection of stops in them. Um, if you know what this is, very good. Uh, if you don't know, this is an, uh, another Fukai type category. But the point is that this result here is slightly stronger in the sense that this restriction functor is not really associated to this Fukai type category. Um, this is something that is intrinsic to Fukai type categories. Um, and with that being said, let me let me justify why um, I care about this restriction functor specifically here. So in some sense, um, this, this restriction functor mimics um, Auslander correspondence in the following sense. So we can construct the Milner fiber, which is the fiber of uh, a regular value of the foundation we have. Um, and we can construct a collection of vanishing cycles on, the, on them that motivates the definition of Auslander algebras in the following sense. So we have um, AN, which is the algebra of an representation type we care about, we care about um, which under Auslander correspondence um, is sent to its Auslander algebra, gamma tilde n, which is defined as the endomorphism algebra of a complete collection of irreducible modules up to isomorphism. So let me write it again as the right category. So we have proof of a n and perfect wealth category of gamma tilde n. So there is some um, previous um, work on this in the sense that this category here is actually known and has been, I want to say classically known, um, to be um, equivalent to the partially Africa category of the disk with a collection of, um, of stops on it. And this is, I do want to mention that this is due to work of um, Ovo and Biden Katz of and Kostevich. And this, um, this Fukaya type category here is as defined by Ovo, uh, Sylvan and other side. So again, I'm not going to go to, into detail about what this is if you haven't seen it before, but the point is that uh, this is known to be um, to be equivalent to it. And you can visualize this category here as a disk with a collection of marked points on its boundary and um, objects of this category here are arcs on the, on the disk here. Um, again, we have on the right hand side that because of our construction, there is a restriction factor to the Fukaya, to the compact Fukaya category of a regular fiber of the, of the foundation we have. And the point is that we can construct this Milner fiber here from this via some handle attachment. Um, and this is not obvious from, from just from, from this fact here. It's, it's a construct that we obtain a posteriori, posteriori. And when I say handle attachment, let me, let me say what I mean by this. So I want to explain this, this in an example. So let me take the quiver, A3 quiver, which is the quiver with three vertices and two hours. Okay, one, two, three and so on. Um, this is known to have three as um, as classes of projective A modules. So I'm going to denote this as P3 to P2 to P1. So again, these are irreducible projective modules associated to this algebra here. Um, and by work of uh, Dicker, Fasson, Michele, and possibly other people, um, this is um, the endomorphism algebra of these objects here is um, isomorphic to the endomorphism algebra of a certain collection of arcs on the disk. 
So I've drawn them here in blue. So you have this three, three um, arcs on the disk here, which who is a nomorphism algebra as defined in the Kaya, um, in the partially of the Kaya category is isomorphic to the anamorphism algebra of this collection of projective modules. Of these projective modules, so I'm going to draw on the left hand side the sort of algebraic view and on the right hand side the more geometric um, view. Um, and I'm going to on the left hand side mimic um, what happens when you go from the from uh, algebra of a final representation type, in this case A3, to its corresponding or standard algebra. On the uh, right hand side, I'm going to go from this category here from the disk with a collection of stops on it. In this case, it's the disk with a collection of four marked points on the boundary. And I'm going to end up with the um, with the Milner fiber of the collection of maps we have. In this case, it's going to be the Milner fiber associated to n equal to three. Okay. Um, so let me mimic on the, on the left hand side how you construct the ensemble uh, algebra. So you go from a collection of projective modules um, you actually take more than them. You take a collection of irreducible modules, so not necessarily projective. And by work of, again, uh, Dicker of Hass and Achille and also Haydn, Kalsakov, and Tomsevich, um, we know that um, isomorphism classes of these irreducible modules correspond by one to one correspondence with all of the possible arcs on the disk. So you have the three projective ones plus. Um, three other ones. So these are correspond to isomorphism classes of all possible irreducible, irreducible modules. Um, on, the, um, on the algebraic side, we want to take the endomorphism algebra of this collection of irreducible modules. And because, um, due to work of Oru, on the geometric side, this corresponds to taking um, the arts we have drawn here and to make specific perturbations of the art so that some of them intersect and some of them don't. Um, this is, um, I'm being very vague on purpose because this is a, a specific prescription that we gives of which perturbation we make. Uh, but the point is that the Milner fiber we have, so it's going to be um, five, I think, yes. It's going to be given by this disk here This is here, and it's going to be. Let me make a correction here. So this is left. Um, it's going to be given by taking all of the arcs and closing them so that they become closed circles. So I'm going to do this for each um, arc. So this becomes a closed circle, and this one also becomes a closed circle, and so on. And for each I'm missing one. So each of these circles, we're going to take um, uh, one handle such that each constructed part is the, the core of this handle. So we're going to make handle attachment as attaching this handle to the boundary of the disk and this handle to the boundary of the disk, and so on and so forth. And you do that for each collection of arts. And in fact, the Milner fiber of the, um, of, of the um, the Miller fiber a collection of vanishing cycles and it is exactly given by this. It's given by a circle and a collection of um, one handles attached to them. Um, so this is in a way due to this restriction function we have here. And this is what I mean when I say that it mimics the construction, the algebraic construction of ensemble algebras. Um, is there any questions so far? I have one question, if, if I may. Um, so you have always this shift, no? You have the um, by two. What is the, the intrinsic reason for that? Um, right. Um, it's it's not really an intrinsic reason, but it's the, um, if you remember, uh, it is known by Gabriel's theorem that um, a n has um, n plus one choose two. Um, oh, okay collection of um, isomorphism classes over usable modules and the map that I've given here as n minus one choose two. Um, okay. So it's, it's 
combinatorical reason. Right? Thank you, Doc. Yes. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so this is one of the main motivations um, as to why I'm care I, I care about constructing this um, this Fukai as other categories associated to this um, as under algebras. Um, I don't think I, I want to get into detail of the, of how the proof of this statement works, but I'm going to flash you the slides that I have right, and I'm going to quickly go over them and see the main points. So there's two um, specific steps that go into the proof of this result. Um, and we start on the geometric side. Uh, we start on the, on the collection of um, um, left shift vibrations I've given you. Um, which, well, they are not sympathetic, they are not uh, left shift vibrations, they are singularities at the origin. Um, the point is that we can choose a very convenient perturbation of, these, of this collection of maps, which turn them into left shift vibrations. Um, I've also said that it doesn't matter which perturbation you choose as to compute the Fukai side of the category, but the convenient perturbation you choose allows you to explicitly compute it. Um, this choice of convenient perturbation is, well, um, follows result, results um, in singularity theory uh, due to a Campo and design aid um, independently. Um, and I've also very heavily used um, heating syntactic version of these uh, results in singularity theory. Um, so uh, modulo a uh, convenient choice of a perturbation of our collection of maps. Um, you can check that the regular fiber of the perturbation of each map is a punctured human sphere, which has the correct uh, topology in all of that. Um, and moreover, with respect to these choices, um, we have a collection of critical values that are completely real. So they we have a collection of critical values on the real line in C. And you can choose, I've chosen here, um, a regular value as fixed uh, as whose um, uh, imaginary part is negative. So you, you choose a collection of vanishing parts on them so that you can construct a collection of lecture thimbles. Um, and with a collection of lecture thimbles you construct with respect to these choices, you obtain an endomorphism algebra of them, which I've written here as this gamma tilde n. Gamma tilde n, um, again, arises as the path algebra of acute relations, which looks pretty similar, if you remember, to the algebra I've given you uh, for the assembly algebra. But the point is that they are not the same. They, they look very similar in the sense they have this triangle structure, but the arrows are very different. Uh, they're not the same at all. In fact, um, there is a problem that the algebra that Matilda and we have constructed is absolutely not isomorphic to the Azonda algebra we want. Um, so I've just flashed out here the corollary here that um, because of the construction we've made, the perfect derived category of this algebra gamma tilde n is equivalent to the Fukai as other category, but uh, the two algebras are not isomorphic. Um, the next step um, to prove the final result is that is basically cons um, constitutes in proving that the perfect derived category, well, the, the, the two algebra, while being not isomorphic, they are actually derived equivalent. Mine. Okay, um, so there is um, there are a few ways to to see that these two categories are direct equivalent. Um, there is a way to prove it using geometry, and there is a way to prove it uh, using representation theory or algebra. Um, the point is that um, on a categorical level, you can see this equivalence here. Um, by constructing an explicit algorithm that relates uh, the collection, a, a natural collection on this category here to a natural collection on this category here. And if you have this explicit algorithm uh, that goes from one side to the other one, you have an equivalence of category. Um, you can also do this more algebraic in the sense that you have these two categories, you have to prove that they are um, equivalent as infinity categories. Um, you can construct what is known as a tilting complex in this category here that you can prove is whose, whose endomorphism algebra is um, isomorphic to gamma tilde n, and then you have uh, an equivalence of categories as a consequence. Or you can also do this uh, geometrically in the sense that um, the sort of explicit algorithm that you have on the categorical level um, is 
also explicit in geometry because it consists of syntactic dentists on the collection of generators you have um, in geometry. Um, so these are just different ways to see this final um, equivalence of categories you have here, which proves the final theorem that the Fukaya said the category of this collection of singularities at the origin is equivalent to the perfect derived category of some material by n. Um, I don't want to really talk about this. The last thing I want to say is um, I've given you a motivation for um, why I care about the syntactic interpretation of this as long correspondence. I want to give you some slightly different in flavor motivation as to why I care about this algebra specifically. Um, specifically, uh, the algebras I obtained uh, in different ways. So this the algebra gamma tilde n and this algebra gamma n, which is the other algebra of type A. And the derived equivalence of these two categories mimics or in, in some sense the higher dimensional equivalent of a well-known fact. And the well-known fact is that um, two, um, if you take the quiver A n with two different orientations of the arrows on them, these are known to be derived equivalent to each other in the sense that there is a series of there is an explicit series of mutations in the two categories that goes from the takes one, one uh, collection of generators of one category and via an explicit algorithm spits out a collection of generators of the other category here. And I've drawn the, um, the objects of interest here. So I've drawn AN, which is the linearly oriented AN quiver, and I've drawn A tilde N with the um, alternate orientation of the arrows. Um, uh, again, these two quivers are well known to be derived equivalent in the sense that perfect derived categories of the um, path algebras are equivalent. And I've also drawn here the two algebras gamma n and gamma tilde n, which are supposed to mimic the higher dimensional equivalent. So you have here this triangular quiver, you have here this triangular quiver. This um, Auslander algebra has arrows, arrows that go up and right everywhere. Well, this algebra here, gamma tilde n, has this sort of more um, alternating versions of the arrow, or alternate orientation of the arrow. Um, so yeah, this is what I mean by it's the higher dimensional equivalent. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Ilaria, for the great talk.